Hi, Elena here. Welcome to another episode of The Shift with Elena Agar. In this conversation, I'm joined with Brendan McAdams. He is a sales expert. We talk quite a bit around what it takes to sell products effectively, how to position your sales strategy. I'm in the space in my life where I'm really trying to kind of upskill myself in the sales space because of the different products and things that I'm building and creating. And I feel it's a skill that needs continuous nurturing. Um, for better or for worse, it's not something that is taught to us in universities or early years and so it kind of comes with a lot of experience as well but there are some strategies and nuggets and things we have to keep in mind and that's what we talk about in this conversation and he also talks about the importance of the right mindset for founders uh, being able to handle rejections and just the power of genuine conversations and being curious about the person in front of you so let me know what you think and as always share comment subscribe and come back for more brendan welcome to the shift podcast Oh, uh, well, nice to have you. Nice to be here, Elena. It's good to be here. I'm really excited to chat with you because the skill set that you have is something that I'm still working on. And it's always interesting to me to meet people who it seems to come naturally to them, and that's sales skills. And as, before we start talking, you know, I said that sales skills is something that everybody should have, even if you're not in a sales role. So whether you're selling yourself or the company or whatever it may be, or product. Um, but talk to me a little bit more about, you know, you've spent a number of years of sales, you're here talking, and we're going to talk about sales and how it impacts one's maybe career growth, performance, and so on. But why should people listen to you talk about sales? Um, yeah, uh, there's a, I have a lot of experience, certainly. I will start by saying, I don't think it's natural for a lot of people. So, and, and I, so I think it's important to appreciate that the people, the listeners uh, shouldn't think that, oh, I'm not naturally good at this and I should be. And I'll, uh, there are some people that are, have the more of a gift of gab and they can, they're, they're, they're kind of naturally better at talking, but uh, I think sales is really much, very much a learned experience. And I, I, I learned it over a number of years and just having a certain level of curiosity, having a certain level of interest in getting better, uh, I think really is as important as, as having any kind of natural sales skills. Um, how did I get started? I got, as a young kid, I, and I was doing stuff. I used to, I used to make things and sell them. And I, um, I had a mail order business when I was a kid. And, <laughs> and so I've kind of been in the space for a long time. My father was very kind of entrepreneurial. And, and, uh, so I kind of picked it up a little bit from him. Um, but I, uh, the way I got really got started in a professional sense, um, was I graduated from, from college with an, a degree in English literature which uh, basically equips you for nothing <laughs> except maybe teaching. And then you got to get a master's and all that other stuff. So I ended up getting into sales for the simple reason that I felt like I could communicate. I could write a decent sentence and I, and I could kind of put some thoughts together. But beyond that, I didn't have any particular sales skills. Someone, someone hired me, fortunately, and I sort of ground my way along until I started to get, get better at it. And so since then, I've been at it in uh, in a enterprise sales sense. I've been selling to AT and T Bell Labs back when AT and T was enormous, and I've sold into Wall Street and and healthcare and so forth. And then I went out on my own, and and um, I've now since run an ex accelerator, and I've done a bunch of coaching, and I've had a, done a lot of mentoring for early stage startups. And that's what I do a lot of now is coaching and training for early stage startups and, and entrepreneurs. And so, so I've, I've got, I've sort of amassed a bunch of experience in that space. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, I'm curious, what made you want to study English literature? Uh, I, I think, I think it was ultimately, I sort of defaulted into it, uh, being a bit of a reader when I was younger. And then, and then it was something I sort of, um, uh, well, I'll tell you exactly why. I I went into it in uh, in college, and I took my first English English one hundred and one sort of class. And the 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 grade I got at the first uh, assignment back was uh, like a D. And it was the teacher came to basically said to me, "You're func basically functionally illiterate." <laughs> And, and, uh, so I didn't have good writing skills at that point in time when I got to college. And so the, the, the motivation for me was, oh, I'm going to prove her wrong. And, and so over the course of the remaining class, I ground away at it. I just kind of sort of through sheer brute force got better and better at writing. And by the end, 
uh, passed the class and did okay. And, and that sort of motivated me to continue in that space. And I sort of got to enjoy it. And I had a couple other teachers that I thought were really kind of fascinating in the English space. And so that's where I, that's how I got it. And plus I was in a, uh, I went to UC Davis, which is a science heavy, uh, uh, curriculum. And, um, and I found that I didn't want to go into science. So mm. interesting. <laughs> it's similar similar to me as well I, I i always wanted thought i was going to be like a doctor or something like that um i really like wanted the, the i wanted to be strong at science i wanted to be strong yeah. at math and i was just so bad at it and ended up opting out to like for like an international studies degree after five five major changes finally kind of landed on that and um because i couldn't pass science or math to save my life like i could yeah, only do the basics right, <laughs> right. Same chemistry. Uh, chemistry killed me. Right. Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Um, and so you got so you got into sales, which uh, you know, I'd say it's probably like pretty lucky to get into sales right after college because I think, you know, I always like I work with a lot of youth and I always advocate I'm like, you should have a sales job like right out of college. I feel like that yes. was my biggest mistake that I didn't make because I didn't go into a sales job, like a traditional sales, because I think it sets you up in so many ways. But also I would imagine you made a lot of rookie mistakes. So what are some of the mistakes you made when you got into sales and like what do people need to watch out for? Oh, that's a that's a great question. And I think uh for me, uh, it's this this notion that you're actually forcing someone to make a decision is the first mm. thing is that you're you're kind of compelling them to make a decision and i think that that uh, you know for a lot of people they they and i run into this a lot with uh with founders and creators and early stage startup companies is they they have a tendency to put off selling because they find it to be sleazy and they're uncomfortable and they're and manipulative and if you really go about it in the right way um you're it's it's it should be exactly the opposite. You're you're trying to determine uh, whether or not there's a fit. If there's a way that what you do solves a problem for someone else. And so I think the the big mistake I think salespeople make a lot is they spend a lot of time talking. And what they should be doing is spending a lot of time figuring out what the right questions to ask are, and then and then sit back and listen. And be curious, and it's there's sort of a zen-like quality to it if you're really doing it well, and that is you almost don't care whether or not you make the sale, right? You only want to make the sale if it's a fit, and if you would start to adopt that attitude, what happens is you telegraph that to the other person. Oh, this person isn't trying to sell me; they're trying to figure out if this even works, and then that changes the whole dynamic with the other person. And then they can start to feel like, oh, I can share more information. And if you're constantly in a situation where you're trying to manipulate them and direct them to a purchase, it it basically it basically telegraphs exactly the opposite, and it causes people to put their guard up. And so this idea that uh, I think the biggest mistake that a lot of people make uh, in in when they you know founders and people that are not professional salespeople and a lot of professional salespeople make the same mistakes is they think, Oh, I have to figure out how to convince them to buy. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the, I think that's a huge mistake. Yeah, no, that, that's powerful. I think just, I, I, I was um, doing a session a while back and um, part of the session was around asking good questions. And this yeah. was for like team development. And it's interesting because when we we're kids, we ask, we ask like um, two to 300 questions on average per day. And then as right. we get into adulthood, it's like 20 to 30 questions per day. And so yeah. at some point oh, we, we be, right? Yeah. So like we, yeah. at some point we, one became, become less curious and more molded in whatever way society molded us. But yeah. also I think it does a lot of damage to your point because we stop asking good questions in general. And I think in sales, right. like even with each other, I mean, how often this is a very American thing is like, Oh, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. But really like your life is falling apart. <laughs> right. It's a right, very right. like surface questions, not that we need to be personal with everybody, but I think just that notion of asking the right questions, us as human beings is lacking. And then let yeah. alone in, in a conversation like a sales conversation, because it's a little bit more targeted and strategic. And right. I think that's a whole kind of art on its own. Yeah. And, and what it does is, um, you know, people like to talk. They like to feel that they're in a comfortable situation. And if they're in a comfortable situation, they'll, they'll, they'll share stuff. They'll tell you things. They'll, they'll, they'll talk and, um, and engage. And so if you're asking a question, uh, and then can, and then can pause and let them give that person the space 
and the time to answer the question. And then you can, and then you can chime in, oh, you know, what do you mean by this? Or, oh, tell me more about that. Or mm. oh, why wouldn't this work? And then let them educate you. Let them feel like they have the the room in which to expand on whatever it is they're thinking. It does a number of things. It makes them feel comfortable. It also makes them feel smart. And if you're really good salespeople, I think are as much detectives as anything else. They're they're investigators. They're they're trying to understand. Understand. And in fact, I spend a lot of time in my in my training. And when I talk to people, when I talk to founders, it's figure out how to do what's called discovery in the sales world. That the the this practice is called discovery, and it's trying to understand what are the things that are important to the customer. What what matters. Uh, what are the obstacles and those sorts of things. And then if you're really in, genuinely inquisitive and genu- genuinely trying to figure out what the, whether or not there's a fit or whether or not you can help them, uh, that, that really does change the entire dynamic of the relationship with your prospective customer. Mm-hmm. And it builds that trust as well. Cause it's, you know, it's, it's, it's Absolutely. almost like this, like, you know, human psychology, again, I was I was reading something and they say that sometimes if you're just in a conversation, especially in a coaching conversation in my world, you know, sometimes in the 30-minute conversation, I'll just ask a couple of questions and the person will just talk the whole time and they'll walk away thinking we're best friends, thinking I'm yeah. the best thing ever when I said nothing about me. Right. But because right. I let them talk and ask the right questions, they felt they walked away feeling so much better. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, a kind of a corollary to this, and it, it's in my book, is uh, my first book, is um, uh, th- there's a, I, it's a bunch of little short chapters about various fundamental components of sales. And one of them is killing your deal. And, and uh, in, in a kind of a variation on asking questions, it's asking questions that might cause them to say this doesn't fit. And, and what you're actually trying to do is you're trying to put them at ease to tell you what's important. And so the example of killing your deal is there, you're in the midst of a situation where you're talking to them. They're like, well, I, I, and you might say something like, yeah, but it sounds to me like if we, with what we do, that wouldn't work. And some variation like on that, and like, and what that does is it puts them in the situation where they have to be the problem solver. They have to figure out, oh no, it would. And here's why, or you have a particular fee. You don't have a particular feature that they need. And you say, well, we, we don't do that right now. We could, we could build it, but, but we don't have it today. Is that going to, you know, it sounds like that's a problem. And now you put in a situation where the customer has to decide, is that really a problem? Mm-hmm. And, and then it's, it can be for uh, a salesperson or an entrepreneur or a founder, it can be terrifying to, to ask that question because you're basically, you're basically uh, allowing the customer to to basically say, I can't use you. I can't, you can't solve my problem, Yeah. but you're going to get there anyway. Right. So why not, why not put that out there and let them solve for it? Because what they, what that does, that sort of a question actually gets them to decide, Oh, I'm going to sit on the same side of the table as you and figure this out together. Maybe I don't need this feature or maybe I can wait on this feature or there's a workaround. And, um, and if you put that out there, it, it just disarms them. In a mm-hmm. way, because you're basically telling them, "Hey, I don't have to make this sale if it's not going to help you." I got gotcha. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got gotcha. you. So basically, what you're saying is that um, just inst- you know address like I think it's almost part of being genuine and just being real about what you can and Absolutely. cannot do, right? Absolutely. Like what you can yeah. and cannot just like I can't do that for you, but here's what I can do, you yeah. know. But if we're gonna, you know, and maybe suggest like if we are to do this, this is what what would need to happen. So. So you start to work as partners um, versus yeah. just like trying to just because because I see I mean I've seen some really great salespeople and I, I mean obviously people sell to me all the time and 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 one of the like the ones that I'm just like oh like you know like do a better job is those that are keep trying to push something I don't yes. even need yes. like you didn't even, you don't even know what I need you know nothing about me like you know what I mean like right. you're selling me things I don't need and right. I have. 10 other people that I do know in this space because they've built a relationship that I'll probably buy from, you right. know, and, and right. it's, yeah, it's, um, it's not and, a great and, experience. And a related, related to that is it, because it, they feel like they, they, you're genuinely 
trustworthy at that point because you're 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 being completely uh, uh, transparent in terms of hey here are the pluses that we have here are the things that we can do here are the here's what we can't do for mm-hmm. you. Yeah. and what's what's nice about that if you're on the buying side of that if you're the one with the problem trying to solve a problem now you're sitting with someone and that per- you that you can trust that person so if some other event comes up down the road or you're going to work with these people on pricing down the road or or a new feature or you have to that you know that that the customer knows that from a negotiating standpoint from a from a work, working through problem solving you're probably a better person to work with than somebody else because you're completely apparent and transparent and the thing that, the real thing is is it makes it so much better for you the salesperson you the entrepreneur you the founder it just takes the pressure off of you and yeah. and when they when that pressure is gone, uh, you perform better. Yeah, yeah, because then you can just be have a, just a more genuine human to human conversation versus Absolutely. like a scripted text. Which yeah. I I mean, this is the worst for me when people just tell me what they think I want to hear, and I'm like, uh, right. bored. It's like, yeah. stop. Like you, you know, like it, you just feel it. You feel it. And yeah. some people fall for it. I'm not one of those people. Like I'm I'm pretty like you know I'm not always right, but I'm pretty right about my like spidey right. senses and how I, right. the the energy that other people give off and stuff like that. And and I'm just like, oh man, like it's just such a script and I hate it. Or they try to like another thing that really frustrates me is the the compliments. Like some people start with like the compliment, oh, the amazing work you are doing. And it's yeah, like it's overly, <clears throat> it's over I don't yeah. need like I, I'm good. Like I don't need that. I need you're here for a specific reason. I don't need right. you to tell me the amazing work that I'm doing. You don't know what I'm doing. We just met, yeah. you barely, yeah. you know. It's like I don't like the overly personal. At least for me, that's a that's a buzzkill for me completely. I'm like, oh, make it stop. You know, like let's just have a conversation. You're but right. um, but also there's different ways to to compliment the you know to to kind of uh, do that. Maybe I'm just the wrong audience for those people. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Um, well, there are, and there are a lot of other there are a lot of other components. I mean, sales isn't necessarily completely simple. That's one, but that's one component I think that's that that does uh, that does make um, that that if if you kind of master that, if you kind of get it and get a grip of that, and 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 start to be comfortable in that in that capacity, it's liberating, and uh, and it and it does make you more effective and there are a bunch of other things you need to know as well but but that's like one of the fundamentals I mm-hmm. think. nice no th- those are those are really spot on uh quick question i, I, I did want to talk about your book but before we go and before i forget um there's this notion that if you if you sell something for a discounted price or even if you offer like a freebie like a free trial or like a freebie of something there's this yeah. you know um thought at least in the market at least in my world of like talent development is that people then won't value it as much and so they won't value you as much what do you think about the freebies the the those sort of things that are out there i i think that uh, i happen to think that people are a lot less uh focused on price than 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 you you, than uh we led are led to believe i think people are willing to spend money for value and uh, and oftentimes a, a great deal of money for value if it's if it's valuable to them. So mm-hmm. it's it's one thing to give away advice from time to time because it proves your uh, your expertise. This is a good example of that, right? Yeah. Um, uh, so so I I think just giving things away for free because out of pressure or discounting uh, is what that really indicates to me is you haven't yet. Um, you haven't yet been able to demonstrate the value that you uh, that you deliver. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I find that with with my clients is, oh, they they get to the point where they don't mind spending money with me because they realize, oh, he's going to help me with all this, with this problem or that that technical issue. I can go to I can go to him on, and we can work through something. And, and, uh, in 30 minutes or an hour, he'll come up with four or five really good ideas or angles and, and it results in a new sale for me, a new customer. And so the value is, you know, whatever it costs for, for my time and my expertise is a fraction of what they get out of, out of the, uh, uh, you know, based upon what I tell them, how they apply it later on. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not big on 
discounting for the sake of discounting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I like that. I like the men- what you mentioned is like, that means you haven't gotten to the to that point that you bring value ultimately. Yeah. Like you feel like it's really an internal relationship about with the value you bring and the money aspect versus yes. like the outside. I like that. Yeah. That's good. And I, I'm I'm in a fortunate <laughs> situation. I work in a lot of enterprise sales and a lot of you know rather strategic sorts of selling. You know, especially B two B type stuff. And mm-hmm. and and the the deal sizes tend to be larger. And so it's 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 relatively straightforward how to to demonstrate your value if you're you know uh, but the the thing the thing I would say about this is with with any cut with any uh, anyone listening is if you can get your customer to to decide how much they value their time like what's the cost of their time and chances are they undervalue it to a, if they if they say a hundred bucks an hour it's probably too low if they say two hundred bucks an hour it's probably too low and so. Uh, if you can get to people, start to get them to tell you wh- how much time it takes them to do something and what they value their time at, and then you, as a salesperson, as the founder or the uh, the creator or whomever, says, mm-hmm. "Really, you're probably worth more than that. Your time is mm-hmm. worth more than X." But even say say it's that. How much? If we do this, how much time does that save over over mm-hmm. a month, over a year? Mm-hmm. And then then you start to get to the point where you can say. Oh yeah, you're right, and not to mention the headaches and the the psychological wear and tear it takes on you. So yeah. when you start to kind of com- accumulate all those sorts of things into a business case, then the customer starts to think, oh, you know what, it's worth it. Yeah. Oh yeah, time time is money, and like if you can free up somebody's time, <laughs> yeah. oh, you know they'll sure. be willing to pay money for it. You oh, know, yeah, absolutely. Or like oh, yeah. speed up a process for them, or you know oh. simplify something. But oh, yeah, yeah, that's powerful. Uh, yeah. Mm, that's powerful. So you've written a book and now you're on your sale on the, the next book, which is Salescraft. So what inspired you to write the book? We'll give us a little bit of a snapshot. We'll drop all the links in the show notes for people to access it, but tell me a little oh, bit more. There you go. This yeah. Is, yeah that's, my first book was Salescraft, and that was uh it was accum- it's the accumulation of like a whole bunch of little to-dos and tips and tactics that I kind of am just amassed. I used to keep an, mm. I've kept a notebook of little things, little observations, things that work in a, particularly in a B2B setting. They're applic- applicable in any setting, but it's much more for selling business to business, just little fundamentals, like things to do, how to, how to manage a meeting and, and how to, you know, um, you know, how to kill, you know, killing a deal or how to triangulate among different salespeople, different people, uh, that sort of thing. Um, uh, so, so I wrote that book and, and by the way, to anyone listening, if you had a chance to write a book, it's a worthwhile experience. It's a grind, but yeah. I strongly recommend doing it because it does have a tendency to help you synthesize ideas and, 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 and kind of put everything into a more of a structure. So, so then I've been doing these, um, accelerators and working with early stage startups and so forth. And I've seen some clear patterns that take place and one of, and the, and, and so this next book is called sales launch and it's, it's get your early adopters fast. And, uh, it launches at the end of this month and then in November and, um, anyone that any listener that comes get, you know, if you email me, I'll send you an early copy of it and you can look it over and critique it. Um, but basically the idea is I, in the course of these training sessions and coaching and the accelerators and, and, and the uh, classes that I run, uh, one of the things I found is that people tend to put off sales until it's too late. They've got a great idea, but, and, and then they start building immediately and, and they, they get things out of order. And so I decided to write a very simple book that's you know going to be like 100 and 120 pages that you can read really quickly but it basically nets out these are the steps you need to think about before or as you're launching a business and it, it could be a product but it, but it could be just any business and that's like start your selling process your discovery process early get going on that right away like what and is early <laughs> like at what stage like in the minute you have the idea like, yeah. oh, I, I want to go, I'm going to start a bit, I'm going to start this software business. I'm going to start this, I'm going to build this app. Well, don't, before you do anything, start talking to people, start mm-hmm. your discovery process. And then, and then 
what you really want to do is test this idea out as much as you can. And everybody's paranoid about the fact that, oh, I've got this great idea. If I tell people about it, they're going to steal it. <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> yeah. It just doesn't happen because the effort to build something is enormous and the chance mm -hmm. of failure is enormous. And so really what you want to do is get out there and talk to people. And then, and then based on what you, you learn, and this is all kind of early stage discovery, it's, um, it's um, necessary. Then you start to mock things up. But I mean mock them up, brain dead simple stuff, like draw it out or make PowerPoints. And this, so if it's, a, if it's an app and it screens, just do something on you know, Figma or, or and that's even maybe too much, but um, PowerPoint or sketch it out on, a, on you know, with just draw it out where the, you know, the various fields are and, what, what it, and, and then show that to people and let them, let them you know, uh, tear it up. Let them critique it and and then do that. So that's kind of one of the fundamental components. The other thing is I spent a lot of time in the in the book is I, mindset, the importance of going out with the right frame of mind. And I think a lot of founders uh, don't give themselves credit for having the expertise and the knowledge they should have that, that they have in, inside them. Mm -hmm. The fact that you're the one with the idea and going out there, that gives you a tremendous advantage. And I don't think a lot of founders take advantage of that in the way that they should. And that, and so what I'd spend some time in the book on and in my training and so forth is to is get them to think about their mindset in a kind of very productive, effective way. So mm -hmm. that that was the motivation for the book. It just Because yeah. I saw so much of this pattern happening over and over again of people having an idea and then immediately, oh, I'm going to go build it. Yeah. I'm curious also on the mindset piece because this happened to me last, I think last Wednesday, yeah. And um, I, you know, you hear no a lot, right? You hear no a lot. You hear, you know, when you're when you're trying to sell an idea or the work that yeah. you've been doing and so on. So right. I had I had one of those last week where I was talking with somebody who really just didn't understand where I was coming from. They really didn't get the business. So and right. it, it it was like a lesson learned for me because I'm like, okay, maybe I need to learn how. Like this is the like. One, part of me, I'm like, okay, this is not my audience. And maybe he, he was just completely wrong. Frankly speaking, there was a lot of other things that I don't care to talk about. But right. the lesson I took away is how can I actually simplify what I'm trying to do and what I'm trying yeah. to sell? So this is a new idea that I'm kind of working out. What I'm trying to do, what I'm trying to sell in a way that makes sense to people who have no idea of what right. I'm talking about, who don't yeah. come from that. You know, so that's part of it. But then the, the bigger part here is the mindset because it impacted me for like two days. I was yeah. like a little bit sad. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Like it was, it, you know, I was like, oh my God, like, you know, it just, it made me, um, you know, it's, it's hurtful. And every time you hear no, and you, and you hear a lot of those whenever you're building something, you yeah. know, um, so how do you, how, you know, what, any tips having been, been in this sales industry for such a long time? Like, how do you deal with the mindset piece? Like, how can you, you know, like what works for you? I'm sure it's to each his own, but what works for you to help you continue to keep, keep going, even though people don't get it sometimes, or there's a no a lot. Well, the, the, uh, like I always, I always ask uh, when I when I hear the no, uh, when I hear that no, I want to know, I want to know why it's no. So, so I go in that situation. I I really try, you know, I try and go into a sales situation, try to figure out what I can learn from this. Um, it's m almost as much as, or more than than trying to sell them. I figure if I go in figuring out, oh, I, I'm curious to know how this is going to turn out. And so at some point they're going to say it's not a fit. It's not a fit. Well, okay. All right, I get it. And you and and I appreciate your feedback. Can you tell me why? Like what is it specifically about it? And and in that conversation, you're going to find out it's it's con, you know, it's they're confused. They don't understand what you do, right? Mm -hmm, That's mm -hmm. a the, the 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 reason why people don't buy is besides they're not being a fit is it's it's oftentimes it's it's there's risk involved. Uh, it's too much risk. I'm not going to do it because of the risk. Uh, I'm not going to do it because uh, the pain isn't that great. I'm not going to do it because it's too much effort. And th those are some of the th the reasons why people don't buy. And so so when you when you go in and when they tell you no, you want to find out why it's no, because if it's the pain's not that great, you know, are you not are you not identifying the pain? And this is why I tell people don't build right away because, you know, they have an idea and, you know, the, the, the industry doesn't, this is not a big problem. 
And if you find that consistently in your market, that there's this isn't really a big problem, then building a product for that is going to be a is going to be an unsatisfying experience. Whereas if you understand that, oh, here's the pain. You know, I'm thinking about this the wrong way. And they they once they when they explain to you why it's no, and you start to understand that a if they do, if they don't understand what it is your solution is, then it's incumbent upon you to figure out how to do a better job of explaining it. And so I guess it's just it's just kind of trying to ask the right sorts of questions to get them to understand to get them to explain what it is they don't get. Mm-hmm. And either it, and ultimately it's it's it comes down to it's your fault, right? You have to figure out how to explain it in terms that that matter to them. It's not yeah. their job to understand how how your product works. It's your job to make it compelling to them in language and in a sense and a feeling and with logic that that is uh, compelling to them. Mm. That yeah, no, that's, yeah, absolutely. No, absolutely. I think there's lessons. Like, I love the lessons to learn, you know, from from those, you know, so you can do better next time and next time and next time, especially when you're building something different or, you know, that might yeah. not be, you know. Yeah, yeah there's and a lot to things, consider. Mm. And one of the things about that is if you do have these conversations, you you end up, you have conversations with customers over and over again, you get surprised less and less, mm-hmm. right? start to hear the same thing over and over again and then when you start to hear the same thing over and over again now you're getting closer to oh i know now i know where i need to be i know what my product or my solution needs to do and combined with that is you become you become an expert at it now you not not only do you can you ask the question but you can empathize with oh i know how this works i've talked to 20 people same thing Uh, do you have that here's the problem i run into do you have this? Oh, they go, oh yeah, that's exactly what I'm up against. Mm-hmm. Now you're on track. Now yeah. you can say, hey, I will have this thing. Right? Yeah. I have this thing. And here's how it does it. Would it work for you? Blah, blah. You know, here's how it works. Blah, blah, blah. What do you think? What would what would be better? What would be different? What, what is it missing? Those sorts of things. You know, those are those are really meaningful conversations. Yeah. Absolutely. Beautiful. Brendan, you and I connected on LinkedIn. Is that the best yep. place for people to find you or where do you hang out at the most? Uh, LinkedIn and then uh, and then email me. And then those are the, the two best ways. And yep. Sounds good. I'll make sure to include all of that in the show notes. Brendan, thank you so much. I definitely learned quite a bit about sales and uh, there's always something to learn. I'm sure my audience has too. And I, I, again, I think this can be applied. This, you know, everything you mentioned can be applied to a product and the product can be you. You can be yeah, the product selling absolutely. yourself into the market, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. And I will remind you, the book, my new book's launching in the end of the month, sales launch. Yeah. So anyone who emails me, if you send me, email me, I'll, I'll send you an early copy. And, and, uh, cause I, it's, you know, nobody, nobody gets rich publishing books. Yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> not what's there for. <laughs> I'm with you. Sounds good. But hopefully you'll sell, you'll sell a good amount of copies so people can actually learn from it and, and, you know, just hear what you have to say. Cause it's super interesting. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. 